Welcome, welcome, welcome to this month's Deal Clinic Live. Can you believe it is October? We have entered the final quarter of the year. I trust your year is going amazingly well. So for this episode, it's going to be an exciting one. I'm really thrilled for all of you. As usual, please drop your comments in the chat box and we will keep an eye on that for you and pass those over to the panel today. There will be snippets of this episode going out onto our usual social media Facebook, Instagram, Shorts on YouTube. And the full version of the show will be available on our YouTube channel, Sourcing Investments Limited, in about a week's time. Now, <laughs> without um, without further ado, I'm going to actually just get straight into it because we've got a very juicy topic today that, that is so full, we could actually do it over two shows. If you haven't registered to the platform already, please feel free to do so. It's sourcinginvestments.co.uk. This month, we are registering, we are revisiting, should I say, a strategy that you as agents and investors have wanted to know more about since the beginning of the year. It is supported living and uh, their providers. So today, we have special guests and new power team members, Andy Fiddler and Paul Roberts of Market Offer. So we want to welcome them on board. We also have our resident investor, Tim Sanders. He's back with us again this month. I'll be dropping in their URL so that you'll be able to contact both Andy and Paul directly. So Market Offer was actually founded by Andy and Paul, and they have a history of working together prior to being business partners. Now, both have solid foundations in business. And in this business, they've already done over 100 deals in their first year. So they definitely know the ins and the outs of supported living and social housing, and they know how to transform your property into a hands-off investment, reduce landlord hassles and make a positive impact, all whilst, may I say, increase your profits by up to 25%. Now, Market rent, market Offer apologies, is a rental platform that helps landlords, investors, developers, agents alike, secure leases with, with supported living and social housing providers. Did you know there's way over 400 supported living and social housing providers? I couldn't believe it when I heard that. Market Offer helps you get the best offer guaranteed, vet and select the right provider, plus ensure your property is protected how cool is that? So without further ado, we have so many guests online. I want to welcome you and all of you that watch on the replay. If you do have any questions, as said, feel free to drop those in the chat box. We'll keep an eye for those for you. We are going to do the presentation first. The first half is going to be an educational piece as they present. Then we'll go to the Q&A. OK, and then we will actually look at two deals after that. So with um, it is with great pleasure that I am happy to hand you over to our newest power team members, Andy and Paul of Market Offer. Gentlemen, over to you. Hey, uh, nice to meet you, uh, everyone. Um, I, I'm, I'm Andy. Um, I'm going to start today and then you'll be hearing from Paul uh, later on. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be talking to you guys about supported living. I think you know whether you're a an investor, a landlord, a developer, and and also an agent. I genuinely think support living is you know one of the biggest opportunities uh, out there for you. You know if whether you know especially if you're looking for secure income, uh, not too much hassle, or, or potentially you're just fed up with the uh, the private rental sector. Um, and so yeah, as Bonnie mentioned, Paul and I we're the co-founders of Market Offer, which is a lease platform that helps all of you secure leases with over 400 supported living providers. And uh, today I'm gonna to talk you through how to succeed in supported living and, and social housing, uh, and really just share with you the framework that we've built that underpins our success, uh, which you can use uh, to copy and, and, and do, do yourselves. 
Uh, so I've, I've put, put together the, some slides, but just before I do, I just want to kind of um, start with sharing our backstory, just of how Paul and I met, um, and just to give you an understanding of how we discovered supported living and why we think it's such a, a great opportunity. So um, prior to launching uh, Market Offer for the last 20 years, Paul and I have both uh, kind of built businesses across different sectors. I actually met Paul uh, when I sold him my recruitment business many years ago. And then since then, we became friends and uh, invested in various different uh, things together. And, and for me, when I invested in property, the reason I did it is I wanted to build a kind of a valuable, stable nest egg for my, my wife and my future family. And... I, I don't know about you, but for, for me, I had this kind of naive expectation that um, property would be this relatively passive um, uh, and uh, uh, and relatively stable uh, investment. And the, the reality is it, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too long before I was getting calls from my agent about tenants, uh, tenant issues, rent payment issues or maintenance issues. And I suppose at first I thought I just had a bad agent um, and then kind of after kind of looking into it more, I realized there was just a limitation uh, around the private rental sector and I was never really going to get what I wanted. And this was really the spark for Paul and I to basically say, OK, for the next business that we launch, we want to launch into the property sector and we want to create something that basically enables landlords to really, I suppose, get what we want, which is that kind of stable income with not too much hassle. So uh, we started off uh, in the property sector, just sourcing uh, properties really just to kind of learn the market. And through that process, that's when we came across social housing and supported living. And uh, through experts within our network, we learned and just um, understood it more and really started to understand that actually if done right, it really delivers on the thing that we were wanting of stable income and and, and not too much hassle. Um, so fast forward, we've uh, launched Market Offer, we've invested over half a million pounds, we've built a platform that uh, enables uh, landlords to secure a lease with over 400 uh, different sports living providers, and we've now have 100 different units that are leased across uh, the, these different uh, providers. Um, and through that process, you know, we've built up this kind of framework to, of, of our success that, that I'm keen to kind of share through with, with you now. Um, and it's just, you know, through that kind of trial and error, and it's really helped us to kind of deliver. And it's the, it's the kind of thing that I think you guys can copy and, and, and use yourself. So um, I've put together a presentation, um, if I can just share with you uh, my slides. Hopefully all of you can, can see that uh now yeah i've got again a nod from uh bonnie so yeah like i said what i would like to share with you is you know how to succeed in uh support of living and and social housing um so uh let me just move this um in the top right hand corner you, you're going to see a qr code uh throughout and and that's um uh, you can scan that anytime and that'll take you to the source and investments page uh, on market offer. You can click a black button and uh, that basically will enable you to download a free guide to support the living uh, that, that we've created for you and also a few um, uh, other bonuses. It, with the essence of kind of keeping this presentation a bit shorter after speaking to Bonnie, there's some stuff I've had to remove and we'll kind of we'll also add that in. So if you, you can scan that QR code at any point, and, and that will, that information will be sent to you. Um, so just to kind of get started and get everyone up to the same page of understanding what supported living and social housing is, it, although there's a difference in both types of housing, ultimately they're both housing vulnerable people and they're both largely, you know, underpinned and, and funded uh, by the government. Uh, supported living is uh, providing both housing and care. And then that's to basically enable individuals that may otherwise not be able to live independently. So that, so that could be tenants such as people with learning disabilities uh, or autism. Uh, social housing uh, on the other side uh, doesn't actually provide care. And it, the typical tenants would include uh, care leavers, asylum seekers, former homeless, uh, etc. 
And so going forward, saying supported living and, and social housing is a bit of a mouthful. So I'm just going to collectively refer to them as supported living, unless I'm kind of outlining the, the, the differences between both. And the, the framework that I'm keen to kind of share with you is basically split down to, to three strategies. So strategy one is lease it, don't rent it. Strategy two is how to maximize your profits, potentially up to 25%. And strategy three is how to select the right provider and protect your uh, property. So lease it, don't rent it. Um, before I go into detail, I just want to kind of start with this slide. And I, I expect that many of you guys watching this um, will, you know, already kind of know uh, and um, have an understanding of the benefits of, of leases. And some of you will already experience them uh, through the commercial property that, that you own. And the reason for starting with this slide was actually the commercial property and, you know, really the leases that underpin them have really been the kind of one of the core strategies for the super wealthy, the investment banks and the, and the pension funds, etc. Um, and then as commercial properties started to die, uh, these kind of same super wealthy funds have looked for other places that they can invest in that have the same benefits of these commercial leases of secure income, not too much hassle, and more often than not, um, are the tenant will, will pay to, to maintain the property. And so for the last 14 years, um, these guys have been investing in supported living. And then um, I suppose from their point of view, it gives them the same benefits of a commercial lease, but it's within a growing market. And it also has the added benefit of the fact that the, the rent is largely underpinned by government funding. And then over the last four to five years, uh, landlords and uh, kind of smaller developers have also started to cotton onto this and switch from the private rental sector. And really Paul and I have just seen a massive uptick just in the last year of people you know, deciding that they want to move from the private rental sector in, into supported living. Um, so that's why other people are moving. If you wanted to to switch to the supported living space, how does it work? Uh, how would you lease your property? So you would lease your property for uh, three to five years to a supported living provider. Uh, you would get paid every month with no bills and no voids. Uh, the provider would house their vulnerable tenants within your property and then they would manage and maintain uh, the property uh, for you. And so that's how it works. You know, why, why would you want to switch to a supported living uh, provider and the, the lease that, that underpins it? So you would get long term secure income. You'd get paid every month with no uh, voids and no bills to worry about. There's free maintenance and, and management. It's a, a lot less hassle. Um, there's tax benefits on, on many types of leases. As I said, it's largely underpinned by, by government funding. A big thing for many people is you'll be creating a genuine positive impact for the people you house and the society around. And also for many of you, you'll, you'll actually see an uplift in your profits. Potentially, you know, some of you will be up to a 25% in, increase in, in your profits. Um, but don't take uh, my word for it. You know, Kathy, who is an NRLA landlord that, that came to us, um, uh, you know, sums it up nicely compared to an AST. It's, it's five years of, of not too much worry. Um, now, she uh, came to us where she had two troublesome tenants who weren't paying uh, her, her rent. Um, and it took her so long to, to get them out uh, that at the point that she did, she was actually considering selling a property. And then that's when she heard about market offer. Um, and within a week of putting her property up on our platform, we're able to secure a lease with a supported living provider who now pays her every month, manages and maintains the property for her. You know, it's a great hands off uh, uh, solution for her. And she's now actually leased two properties via us um, and actually with the same uh, provider. So hopefully at this point, you know, you like the idea of supported living and naturally what we next get from a landlord is, OK, well, how much can I earn? So this kind of part um, of our, our framework, this strategy is really to actually take it a step further and say, with your property, how can you actually maximise your profits and how can you potentially increase them you know, by up to 25 percent? Um, so. Uh, again, before going into the detail, I just want to start with this slide. Um, many of you won't uh, recognise me, uh, but this uh, this younger gentleman on the left is actually a photo of my, myself. It was back in 2003. I just launched my first business, which was a, a student 
travel marketplace uh, on, online. And the local press had just um, done an article on myself. And then 15 years later is another photo uh, of me where uh, NASDAQ had put it up on their towers in Times Square to congratulate for an award that, that our business had, had just won. And, you know, the, the reason to share this isn't to show off that I was once slimmer and had a full head of hair. But it was actually to kind of illustrate the journey that both myself and my co-founders have been on and how it relates uh, to this next section. Um, as kind of Bonnie touched on, many people are aware of supported living. Maybe you've heard the, of the one or two big providers such as uh, Serco, who has the asylum seeker contracts um, with, with the government. But many people don't actually realize there's actually over a thousand different supported living providers uh, across the UK. Um, but there's no real kind of competitive market uh, to actually make sure that you're getting the best offer. Uh, or that th there wasn't until, until we came along. And, um, you know, just like within the private rental space, you know, if you were to just market your property to, you know, one tenant and that one tenant knew that you were just marketing it to them, and then you said, oh, how, how much would you pay um, for my property? Do you think they're going to give you the best deal? You know, most likely not. And, you know, the reality is, um, you know, even with the best will, providers are naturally incentivized to negotiate you down. And it's so within that kind of frame that we've kind of created a competitive marketplace. And, you know, even if you're looking to do it yourself um, directly, that we would recommend that you kind of do the same. And so it's within that kind of that framework that I go into this kind of uh, next section. So this is kind of the, the market and kind of illustrates how how much the providers pay. So at the um, bottom of the pyramid, social housing, they typically pay anywhere between LHA rate and market rate. And then supported living providers pay anywhere between market rate and above market rate up to about 30% uh, above market rate. Um, oh, and I suppose just one thing to, to mention on here is that, you know, all those supported living does, you know, it, 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 you know, it does drive a higher uh, income. It does take longer to secure those types of deals. And the providers are more specific around the type of properties that they're looking for, whereas social housing um, uh, is uh, has a, a much bigger demand. It therefore takes on a much wider range of, of properties. And, it, and it's a much quicker deal turnaround. So how much could you earn? Well, all, all of you guys watching will have different properties. So uh, it's the same when a landlord rings us. What we kind of say is a, a simple way to work out, you know, is it worth moving over? And no one really moves over to us unless they're going to make, you know, unless it makes financial sense. Is to basically say, if you come through us, we would say typically you should aim to basically be able to achieve the market rate is if you were to rent it on the private marketplace. Um, plus take into account that you'll get free maintenance and then take into account that you, you're going to have no voids for the next kind of three to five years. That should ultimately deliver you more profit. It will also give you more time and it will also give you more uh, peace of mind. So um, how to maximize uh, your profit? Um, so our view is that you need to create a competitive uh, market um, and, um, uh, you know, whether you're looking to do it directly or go going via uh, um, us, um, once you've got that in place, you're then able to negotiate rent. Um, once that's locked in, the other kind of key thing is to go through our uh, rent increases. We would always recommend uh, putting in. Typically, you can get anywhere between every 12 to, to 18 months, um, and it's CPI uh, linked. Um, we recommend negotiating uh, the repair responsibilities so that the provider takes on as much of the responsibilities uh, as possible. Um, and then in, from an insurance perspective, not every provider will pay for your insurance. Some, you know, a lot won't. Some will contribute towards it or some, some pay, for, pay for all of it. But there's some of the key terms that you can negotiate. Um, this is point is just really to say, from our point of view that there are some smaller providers who will pay you know silly silly amounts and over the odds but we kind of recommend going with established providers uh, who will agree a more sustainable amount and therefore you've got probably you know you've got a more sustainable not just sustainable but secure deal uh, for yourselves 
And then this point just needs a, a little bit of explanation. So providers are funded from different sources, um, some of them from national sources and some of them from local sources. And the one thing that you want to avoid is you've got your property being pitched into the same commissioner, the same local authority from multiple providers all at different rates. And so what we'd advise is if you have multiple providers that are all funded locally, interested in your properties, to get them to view your property first, get them to confirm interest and give you an indicative offer. And then from there, kind of prioritize who you want representing you and taking you to the local authority first. Um, or if that all sounds a bit complicated and you would like a, a much uh, simpler, easier version, then you can just upload your property into market offer and we can get you the, the best offer guaranteed. Our platform um, has data on all of these providers. We'll match your property up with the, the relevant providers. And then we also, in addition to the tech, we kind of do the heavy lifting of the negotiation just to kind of secure that you that that best deal. Um, you may have already seen us, you know, within Property Notify, NRLA, Landlord, Landlord Zone, uh, et, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if you are keen, you do have a property and you do want to get a lease on it, uh, then this same QR code that you're seeing in the top right hand corner, you can scan that anytime. It'll take you to the sourcing investments page um, on market offer and then just click on the blue button and, and upload your, your property. Um, so this is an example of the power of you know, creating a competitive market, but also really the power that market offer uh, provides with our, our marketplace. So Sean is a landlord, uh, one of our landlords. Uh, we were able to increase his rent by 22%. And um, he originally got an offer for 3,600 from a provider. He really liked that provider. That provider is actually quite a big provider. It's quite well established. And typically they wouldn't negotiate uh, so much. Uh, however, we were able to get an offer for 4,400. So quite a significant uh, increase. And we were able to go back to that kind of first provider and say, look, um, Sean is interested, he likes you, especially the fact that you're established um, quite significantly, um, but you need to match his rate. Um, uh, and so they came back, they matched the rate of 4,400. And then after a bit of negotiation, they also agreed to pay for his insurance completely, which is an, an additional, I think something like 1,200 uh, pounds a year for the, this block of flats he, he had up north. Um, so hopefully by now, uh, you know, you really like the idea of supported living. You like the fact it could give you secure kind of hands off um, uh, income and potentially how much money you can make. Naturally, the next thing is from a landlord's perspective is to say, OK, well, how good are these providers? How reliable are they? Uh, what would happen to my property? What happens, uh, you know, if it gets damaged? Um, so, again, before going to the detail, I just want to kind of bring back um, out and start with another story and bring back uh, Kathy, who I spoke about before. So, uh, as I mentioned, she had two tenants who who weren't paying her. Um, what I didn't mention is these guys were actually, you know, in full time employment. So they were professional tenants who just decided to stop paying. It took her four months to evict them. They still owe her several thousand. And uh, as I mentioned, it kind of caused her to a point where she was actually wanting to sell uh, her her property. And, you know, just like her, we also have lots of other landlords coming to us from the private uh, space where they have not been able to, um, where there's been tenant damage and they've not been able to get that, that payment back off the, those individuals. And so the reason I kind of start this is to kind of frame the conversation and really say, no matter what tenant type, you know, is in the house, um, ultimately they're people and, you know, you get good people and you get bad people. And you, know, you I could go as far as saying, as you know, you know, within students or, uh, you know, professional tenants or even Airbnb guests, they don't always value, you know, your home or the house, the, the property that, that you're giving them. Um, you know, some of them will just see it as a stopgap until they eventually buy their own property or till they return home home from holiday. On the, In contrast, many support living tenants, you know, uh, really value the roof that you're putting over their head um, and want to treat it. Uh, like it's their kind of own own home. Um, however, like I said, they are people and damage, you know, does happen sometimes to, to properties as with any kind of tenant types. 
Um, but the key the key difference is that you're contracted in with a support of living provider. And if you um, have selected and sort of done the right process, then you've got a, a, a lot more is a much bigger advantage. So your uh, the the support of living provider is contracted in to pay for all tenant damage. Um, if you have vetted and selected the provider correctly, they have plenty amount of of cash to be able to pay for that damage um, and then also they've got the maintenance teams in place to go and actually just repair the damage meaning it's kind of you know no hassle from from your point of view so with that in mind um, we have the kind of the following sort of three key steps that we kind of uh, take uh, to give our landlord security and peace of mind and we would kind of recommend that you kind of follow the, the same approach um, so one is to vet and select the right provider. Two is to ensure that you get the terms set up correctly. Uh, three is to put a process in place that oversees the provider and, and ensure that the, you know, the property is, is being maintained uh, throughout the lease. And as mentioned, I've actually had to pull, I had some checklists within here, which was, you know, if you didn't want to go via us and you wanted to do it yourself, we had some checklists of, you know, these are the key things you should be looking for, you know, within lease terms. Uh, I've had to pull them out because of time after kind of doing a dry run with uh, with Bonnie. So uh, if you can just, if you want them, you can scan this QR code, click on the black bu button. In addition to sending you the free guide, then we'll follow up um, with th these checklists that I've, that I've had to pull out. Um, so uh, number one, vet and select the, the right provider. Um, what we do uh, is that we only work with established business businesses as, as a minimum. They've got to have two years of uh, filed accounts, but typically the providers that we work with are anywhere from, you know, 10 to 20 years old. Um, we will provide a landlord or an investor with a company summary of, um, you know, this is what, what the provider does uh, and the tenant types, et cetera. And then if they're interested, we then provide them with a full credit report uh, that is produced by um, a credit agency called Credit Safe, and in addition to all the kind of the financial information that, that's in there about their financial history, are there any kind of CCJs that are existing or, or prior? Um, it also clearly kind of maps out um, how much annual rent this provider uh, can, can pay, um, and typically the providers that we work with can afford anything between 150k and 1.6 million pounds uh, a year um, per property, you know, so that really does allow you to, you know, mo most of you here will, will easily fit within that within that range. Um, and then we also do ongoing credit monitoring uh, via Credit Safe, just to give you that ongoing uh, peace of mind. Um, as I said, if you want your own, um, if you want our checklist uh, of key terms then if you scan that qr code i'll be able to send them uh, separately but what we've done is we've actually built our own uh, lease template and this is based off our own experiences you know the the good and the bad and seeing many leases that are again are you know best and, and worst leases and from there we've we've created a, a lease template that's really easy for you as a landlord to read and understand um, and also so that when we negotiate and adapt it, it kind of fits around specifically around uh, your property. Instead of it just being in a whole range uh, or, or, or garble of, of words, we've broken it down easily into, into tables. So it's, you know, will the provider um, be providing a rent increase? If so, how long? Is it every 12 months? Is it every 18 months? Is the provider going to pay for the landlord's insurance? Yes, no. If so, how much? 50%, 8%, 100%, etc. Um, one thing that we also make clear and that we would recommend that you do, whether you go via us or anyone else, is to uh, get a break clause in. I think you know the the opportunity of a lease is that you have two great people that want to work together over the long term and that's in it and it gives each other security but if one party's not happy there's no point in being in it and so we would recommend to get a one-year break clause that gives each party enough time to work out if the other person is trustworthy and, and delivering and then if if not you can go guys can go off into the sunset at the break clause 
but hopefully you go okay that's great let's work together uh, for the for the long term um and one of the other kind of key things that we've got in our lease but we'd also recommend you make sure is in your lease um is uh that it's just clear repair and compliance responsibilities this on the right hand side is an example one of the kind of many tables that we've got this kind of breaks down the kind of minor repairs and maintenance it goes beyond this kind of screenshot of every different type of uh, uh, maintenance type and ultimately who's responsible for it um and then in, in another part you know within what time scales does does that party need to deliver on um, so that's the terms. The, the next thing is really just to ensure you, you've got a process in place just to kind of oversee the provider and ensure the property is being delivered on. What you don't want to be is just kind of leaving it to kind of hope and goodwill that within five years time, everything is going to be great when, when you get it back. Um, and so what we do is we do a schedule of condition, uh, both at the beginning and at the end of the lease, and we tie this into the lease. And this really kind of sets, this is the standard and expectation that the property needs to be maintained to throughout the lease and also returned to minus, obviously, fair wear and tear. Um, we do property inspections uh, every six months. And then we also hold the provider account uh, to account against their terms. And we'd recommend the same, you know, even the best providers will uh, sometimes get things uh, wrong and sometimes think it's your, your responsibility. So don't be afraid if you're doing it yourself just to push back and say, look, you know, actually we think it's um, it, this is your responsibility. Um, so ap apology uh, for the image on this slide. And it is quite a cheesy uh, sort of handshake image. I couldn't think of something better. But really the, the point I'm trying to say within this slide is the benefit that you have within supported living compared to, again to the uh, the private rental space is it's at least for three to five years potentially longer because of that it's making sure that you spend a bit of time up front to get things right and in that time you get to know who who you're you're working with and whether you're working you know with us and you're going via us or whether you're working directly with a provider it's using that time to kind of really get to understand and with a partner I believe you, you want to find someone who, you know, when the chips are down, you, you can trust them and they're going to have your back and they, they're going to look after you. Even if you're going directly with, a, with a, a provider, they're going to work out a solution and they've got that kind of culture of trust ingrained within the business. Um, and so the benefit you have with support of living is you get that a little more time and so what, what we find is that even if a provider has passed all the kind of ones and naught checks of credit ratings and reviews and everything's positive if it comes to a point where we're negotiating terms for example and they are maybe a little bit tardy on timelines or not quite doing what they said they were going to do within the time frame that they were said they would do it then and if, you know when that's happened on a few occasions we've gone back to the landlord and we've just said look we don't recommend well you know we recommend that you, you don't go with this provider um and even though look we would obviously want the deal and the landlord wants the deal um each time it's come out as positive and the landlord said look thanks for that and um you know and then we've gone and found them you know an, 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 another lease um and i think you know whether you're looking to go via us or we do it direct yourself that's a, an approach that i think you, you know you should be uh should be doing um, so that's the presentation. I know I kind of rammed quite a lot of information into a relatively short period, but um, as I said, uh, so this is our kind of framework, lease it, don't rent it, how to maximize your profits potentially by up to 25% and uh, you know how to select the right provider and protect uh, your, your property. Um, just before I end, I just want to wrap up with, with one more story. And uh, this is actually from a slightly different angle. Uh, so this is actually a, a property that belonged to one of our landlords called Adam. He developed it originally with the intention of it being an Airbnb. How unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, it, it didn't actually work out. Uh, so he came to sell the property. And uh, in between that period, the interest rates uh, changed. And so he was unable to sell it and he was unable to rent it at a rate that actually you know, uh, made it work for the finance that he had um, on his property. Uh, so he came to us and we were able to partner him with a, actually a really, really good top uh, supported living provider who had paid above market rent and made it back out 
uh, from his point of view for the finance uh, that, that he had on, on the property. Um, that provider housed, you know, they really needed to house someone with uh, special needs and um, uh, they were currently um, had that person within temporary accommodation and this property, you know, really fitted the, the requirements they were looking for. So from the landlord's point of view, you know, he got a great deal. Actually, from the provider's point of view, they also got a good deal because they were able to move them out from expensive temporary accommodation and put them in, you know, his ideal property. Um, but the reason I kind of share this, the kind of the next bit is actually the kind of the heartwarming part of, of this story is that uh, when Karine, who's the lovely lady that, that works for, uh, this provider, um, when she um, introduced uh, the tenant to to his new home, she said he was absolutely ecstatic. And then when she walked down to the end of the garden and sort of turned around and looked through the window into the living room, he was literally doing jumping jacks of joy that he's got this amazing home for himself. And I think for us, um, you know, I think that really kind of sums up the benefits and the all together of all the great things that what supported living can, can give you and the fact that it can build wealth for both you and your family it can enable you to have a much more passive uh, experience um, but also it can make a massive you know impact to the people that you put in your homes um, as well as the kind of surrounding society um, so uh, with that in mind I'm, I'm hoping that you know many of you guys watching this love the idea of supported living and you know like the idea of having kind of secure hands-off uh, uh income potentially how much more money you could make um and um uh, also you know potentially the impact that, that you could have on the people uh, in your properties so you're potentially going to fall into two camps some of you may have properties right now that are ready uh or you know or they'll be coming up that would be ready for lease um and others just may want to learn more uh, so what we've got we've uh, got something that we'd like to give all of you which is actually we think is really special and it um, will help give you both the insight and the knowledge to succeed within uh, supported living. And this is something called the Impact Club. Um, we created this actually off the bat that we would often get landlords coming to us and saying, OK, well, where can I buy property that would give me, you know, uh, enable me to get the best rates and, and the best provider? Or I've got this property. What's the latest demand that's coming up um, for providers within in my space? And so <clears throat> we've obviously got access to 400 different providers, and that data is constantly uh, building. And you know, members of the Impact Club basically get the latest demand updates uh, from providers. They get high yield hotspots. Um, they get expert tips uh, and insights. Um, and then, you know, lots more offers, et, et, et cetera. So currently this is done via email, uh, but soon uh, we're launching a, a WhatsApp uh, version soon. Um, and, you know, best of all, if you if you guys join now, um, then you get lifelong uh, membership that is free. Um, so um, if, uh, if you guys are interested, um, then if you go to market offer, uh, .co.uk forward slash SI, which is the source investments partner page on market offer, or you can scan that QR code. Um, that will take you to the uh, market offer source investments page. From there, you can click on the black button that says get free guide and an impact club. You'll get the free guide to support the living. You get the free membership to the impact club. I'll also follow up. It, it may take me a couple of days with the slides that I've had to pull out of here, which is checklists of things you should be looking for um, within uh, lease terms, et cetera. Um, and they will also give you access to our platform. So should you then want to go and get a lease with us um, and get the best offer guaranteed, you can upload your property uh, and do so. Um, so that's it. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to jump in really quickly, Andy. That was such an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. We we have plenty of questions that have come in. I have questions. I'm wondering whether Tim has questions. So I want to get those in and then we, we need to swiftly move on to Paul because I know Paul has two very great examples of actually what you deliver in this sector. So um, Lewis has asked, what are the tax advantages 
and what areas does this work best in? So um, the, the tax um, is, is capital allowances basically apply to uh, leases that have um, where there's care provided. So it, it doesn't really apply to social housing. It just applies to uh, certain types of so supported living where there's um, a certain amount, you know, high, high level care that, that is provided. And you can then claim um, capital allowances. I imagine probably many of you that have commercial property or service accommodation potentially would have come across this. Um, but it enables you to claim, I believe, something like 30p in the pound on your um on the, the the value of your property and any kind of renovation that you've done um that you wouldn't get 30p back that's basically what you would put against within your um your kind of tax reclaim so you would effectively get the the the, the that you would mark that as a loss so if it's in a company you'd effectively be saving 20 percent of the 30 percent if that makes sense Yep, that makes sense. And then obviously, if they need more or more in-depth information around that, I would highly recommend the people. Yeah, and we can introduce you to. Or, yeah, or a tax advisor. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. And um, the second part of that question was, uh, what areas do, does this strategy work best? Um, so, I mean, the, we we start off operating nationally. We work with our 400 supporters of living providers are nationally. You know, it's big nationally we at the moment we start just in england it's it's big uk k wide and the market is just growing and, and and growing um for us we are have just purely from an operational side had said right least wise we're just going to focus on uh liverpool and and greater manchester for now and then then grow back um back uh outside from there but but really there is sort of demand you know nationwide irrespective of whether you want to come with us or not paul may be able to answer that question as, as well um yeah hi hi guys appreciate it. i haven't uh, said anything for the th first 30 minutes so uh, it is lovely <laughs> to uh to, to meet you all and andy stone and the limelight there with um um you know with, with a well put together presentation but um and i think as andy said we've um uh, as far as um, areas go, and, and this is on a, you know, if you work on the basis that you're looking at this strategy, um, you know, perhaps we can help, perhaps we we, we can't. But, um, you know, UK-wide at the moment, there is um, there is a massive demand for, um, you know, both social housing and, and supported living. Um, you know, we've got a key focus at the moment. And because there's so much demand, you know, we've really decided to sort of focus in on um, the sort of Liverpool and, and Greater Manchester area, um, you know, with a view that we'll build those areas up and then um, we'll expand um, sort of outside of that. But, um, you know, typically, so within our areas, obviously Liverpool and um, surrounding areas, and then within Greater Manchester, you know, we've got, um, you know, Oldham, Rochdale, um, Stockport, Tameside, Stratford, um, Salford. So, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, um, you know, when I take you through the deals, happy to go go through a bit more around what, um, you know, what providers are looking for and, and the kind of things that you should be looking at now. Um, but, you know, as I say, there, there's a, a national demand at the moment and, um, you know, and there, there's a, a real push as well um, to get, um, you know, individuals both um, one out of hospital, um, you know, because some of these individuals on the supported living side are, are waiting to be discharged. Um, and then also, you know, there, there's a, a high number of people across the UK um, who are um, in temporary accommodation in hotels who are looking for, for permanent housing. OK, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Paul. Um, you've uh, you've actually answered, I believe, Liz's first question, which was which area do you cover? Because she already has some social housing um, uh, properties and is looking for the best leasing company. So, Liz, I would actually say to you to reach out to Andy and Paul at Market Offer and see if they can help you with that. Her other question was, which repairs do you cover um, because she says her existing cover is like minor internal repairs. So, so typically, I mean, each lease varies. So, the and it, depending on what the provider uh, is kind of offering or green. Typically, I'd say ninety percent of leases are internal repairing leases. So, as a landlord, you would be responsible for the the structure, the boiler, you know, the the roof, etc. Um, and then what the provider is typically looking after is all of the kind of minor repairs that are inside. And that kind of really enables you to, 
um, I suppose, not have to bother for call outs where there's a leaky tap or any kind of issues uh, around that, but anything kind of significant structurally, then that tends to be the, the landlord's responsibility. Um, however, you can get fully repairing leases, which are, are rarer, um, and they're more for specific certain types of, of properties. Um, and that would be where everything um, is, is covered. And I think that's one of the things we look to do within our, our kind of lease. And if you do it yourself, it's just kind of really kind of ironing out specifically what that provider will do um, uh, and negotiating uh, around that. Perfect, perfect. Um, Abby has come in with, in terms of social and supported living, do you help people to secure contracts with the government? No, so we we help um, we uh, our kind of marketplaces with the actual providers, and so those providers will already have their own kind of relationships with the actual government. So, uh, yeah, typically they're companies that are kind of ten to twenty years old, turning over tens of millions. Um, you know, they've they've already on uh, got long term contracts with the government. Um, so we're not actually going direct to the government, and I think that's actually a value. You know, because these supported living providers are built to wrap around you as a, as a landlord. And so they have things like the maintenance teams in place, et cetera, where Paul will probably be able to talk about, uh, you know, um, better where he speaks to landlords, where they've maybe just uh, leased directly with um, the local uh, housing authority and not always um, had things go well. No, I think just to add to that, I think, you know, a lot of councils are are stretched. I think they do great work. Um, but, um, you know, effectively, I, I suppose, by situ, I mean, the, um, you know, the uh, the, the council, the, com the local commissioner, um, he's, uh, so say a care commissioner will be, um, you know, will have oversight on what the need is for that local area. Um, and they'll be getting referrals through and they'll have a pipeline of referrals. And that could be five, ten, you know, uh, like hundred a month. Um, um, of a you know particular tenant type, um, and typically there's a, there's a variety of different um, commissioners that sit within um, you know a council, and then ultimately they don't have the resource to be able to um, to manage um, say you know that could be care leavers, it could be ex offenders, it could be victims of domestic abuse, um, you know obviously, so they will go out to external bodies, and then what they'll do is they'll agree a housing package and a care package for that individual, um, and then they'll have a pre-approved list of uh, providers um, that are best suited to help with that tenant and um, provide one the housing and two um, the support that they need so effectively the money comes from the government uh, but it's via a separate um, separate entity amazing thank you so much we have um, a handful of other questions but I really want to go to the deals um, I do have one question because I used to you know I had my own um, estate agency business before it's bespoke agency so I, my first client was more social housing. So I, I know what we used to source for her, um, for her portfolio, for her social housing um, clients. What is the best type of uh, property that would suit this supported living strategy? Can I go, go Andy, on that? Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, uh, you know, and again, uh, it, it depends on budget as well, right? And, and, and where you sit, um, uh, you know, or financially what you're looking at so you know where i see the demands um you know pr previously i think a lot of investors and uh, a lot of people were going down obviously the hmo strategy and that that's still obviously a strategy that works really well um uh, but you know where we've seen a shift now in demand is for um you know is uh, one bedroom unit so blocks of of self-contained flats and the, and the reason being is just from a um, a safeguarding and duty of care perspective um, say if you've got a provider that is housing say adults with learning difficulties um, you know they, they can't have five flats in a block of 50 um, they don't know who the other tenants are they could pose a risk um, to those tenants um, so so typically you know a provider um, you know what providers are looking for at the moment especially on the supported living side uh, would be self-contained blocks of flats um, yeah, um, and, and typically there'll be one bedroom um, and then some form of, you know, and again, uh, a, a provider will always say, look, we want this, this, this. The reality is that that might not exist. So look, if it's five one bed flats, great. If it's got some communal space, even better. 
um, parking even better because obviously some of these individuals will need to have their own separate transportation. Um, so blocks of flats is the, um, you know, is where I would say the highest demand is at the moment. Um, and then if you're looking for, say, um, you know, a, a smaller capital commitment, um, bungalows as well are, are in high demand. Because um, if you just think from a supported living perspective, having a, you know, a self-contained bungalow, it's only on one floor. Uh, it's easy to make adaptations if that is needed. Uh, there's no stairs in the property. Um, so, yeah, bungalows, um, blocks of flats, uh, and then, you know, I would say, uh, you know, two to three bed houses. Okay, amazing. Um, Tim, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to put, gentlemen, I've got a few more questions, but I'm going to send them to you via email with who yeah, are. Sure. And then you'll be able to address those. And for those of you that have asked and haven't aired those questions here, verbally, please feel free to reach out to Paul and Andy via the um, barcode, uh, sorry, keep calling that a barcode, via the QR code, um, or I'm going to show you how to find them on our Power Team panel. Um, Tim, let's come over to you because I'm really conscious of time. Just, uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, guys, really, really good presentation. I think there are so many questions from so many people. So, um, yeah, it, I, I think we could definitely do another one. Um, following on from what you were saying with, with the ideal um, type of property, I've got two types of property, actually, myself, that are on supported living strategies at the moment. One is a, an end terraced small um, two-bed place, two, sort of two up, two down with a small kitchen. Um, and one's actually a bungalow. So exactly what you've just said, the bungalow's working perfectly because that was actually inherited into the family and it's got wheelchair access already as part of it. So I'm um, presuming when you're talking about the tax benefits and things as well, the types of uh, wheelchair ramps, uh, having flat floors, having handles, things like that, that would all be under the, the tax claims and be able to claim that back from the tax man. Am I right? Yeah, yeah um, I, I mean, I, I think firstly, just, just to add, you know, look, we're, we're not tax accountants, so, you know, you would need to speak to, um, you know, your, your relevant uh, um, sort of specialist. But, you know, yeah, our, our understanding and we've had clients who have been able to make uh, claims back against those uh, against those alterations. I mean, it, 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 as I understand, it's very similar to, um, you know, the uh, capital allowances on, a, on an SA unit. Um, so but but again, I, I would speak to your relevant expert um uh, or one of one of you and i think that's and then the biggest thing even though that there will be an old you know that there'll be a cost of, of alterations if, if you know if you wanted to alter the property or renovations if if that kind of was needed that your the biggest is that thing, covered by the housing association or is that something that you would cover yourself because i know that was the question that was also in the chat as well uh the cost of changing things is that something that you can ask the association to uh to pay for yeah, it's, it's, it's a negotiation, Tim. So, um, you know, some it, it, it all depends on the providers. You know, we, we've had uh, very, very early on in, um, you know, with the business, you know, we, we had a, you know, provider that, you know, that, that paid for, for a refurb because they were that desperate to get a property. But they, they were a smaller business that had been going for two years. They were struggling to get the right property. And in the end, they, they took on the cost of a refurb. We, don't, we, we tend to, to work with large providers now. But um, if, it's, if it's specific alterations required for um, an adult with, with a specific need, uh, then typically the provider will contribute to, um, you know, like to those alterations or, um, you know, we could provide, you know, it, like we could provide an uplift in the rent um, as a result. So it's, you know, th there's always a cost benefit of, um, you know, of, of that. Either they'll pay for it or we'll get you more money as a result of the alterations you've made. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and just quickly, and on the, the capital allowances, it's it would be the biggest amount will, there will be obviously a co small cost on making the alterations, but the biggest is that you claim those capital allowances against the whole value of your property as well as kind of any any renovations uh, against it that, that makes sense brilliant thank you thank you i mean i've got a, a ton of other questions i know we need to get onto the deals um so we'll, we'll jump those at some point if throughout the deals if you might be able to mention briefly whether this affects any kind of you need to get any kind of go ahead from mortgage companies for this kind of stuff while you're going through the deals that might be handy for people yeah, yeah do, do we Go on, Andy. Yep. Yeah. Should I just quickly answer that now? Yeah. So, um, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, for you to the 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 types of properties really need not beyond just the mortgage need to really be ones that are freehold, 
uh, or share of freehold, or if it's a uh, you know a block of if you've got a um, a flat within a block of flats, it needs to be an older school block where the lease doesn't prevent you from the lease um, hold doesn't prevent you from actually having a, a, a lease, and then. Uh, the other thing is we would say is that you know you, you need to um get approval from the, the the mortgage provider so we we tell people that we can't hold people to it it is down down to them but we would always advise people that they get a, a, approval from the mortgage provider um do do me to bring up the deals now yeah that would be great I must admit, Tim, when I was watching some of your earlier videos, I thought it was going to be a bit like Dragon's Den. So, uh, you know, I was getting a bit worried about, um, you know, sort of, you know, having to go to the back of the room and, and having to think about some of your questions. So, uh, so go go easy on me. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've just fired you up now. Um, okay, so so this is our uh, so, so this is a very recent deal for us, and um, uh, actually Andy's al already referenced um, th this deal to um, you know the, the the young tenant who moved in who was doing jumping jacks. So um, yeah, effectively it was a two bed bungalow um, that the landlord had developed. Um, again, he he it wasn't delivering as an SA unit um, early on, and um, also actually um, he'd made the decision so. Um, he lived on a in another property on the same site. They they built an additional bungalow, um, and then him and his uh, wife were looking to buy a, another property. So they're in a situation where they needed to um, access some cash. Uh, it wasn't delivering a, as an SA unit, so the landlord then decided that he wanted to try and sell it. Um, the mar uh, the the mortgage rates obviously increased. He was in a bit of a spot, um, difficult position, um, and um, he was unable to get. Um, when he tried to rent it or, or looking at renting it on the private market, um, um, he was only able to get around 1200 The other interesting fact as well was the fact that because um, effectively he needed to remortgage this property as well. Um, and the valuation that he was getting on that property was based on market rent at £1,200. Um, now, we managed to secure him um, £1,800 a month. Um, for the property um, and um, again with a bit of shifting on his mortgage um, he was able to gain a greater valuation on the on the back of that contract and it was with a very financially secure provider as well um, mm -hmm. who the mortgage company really liked um, they, they wanted a few little changes on the agreement which we were able to work work through with the provider they're very amenable um, and he was able to gain a higher valuation on the property um, uh, which he wasn't able to to uh, to get um, previously um, and effectively um, yeah it was an internal repair in lease uh, as Andy's already outlined um, which covered all the internal repairs um, there was one individual um, who was moving into the property with um, who had learning difficulties he had a two for one care so there's two carers that look after him they don't live in the property but then they and they offer him um, sort of full support over um, a 24-hour period um, it's a five-year lease term it's CPI linked so every 12 months there is a uh, a rent review um, and um, yeah that that was the basis of the deal um, and then really what we've done is is we've just done a comparison here uh, and I'm sure that you know um, again, when we're looking at estate agency costs or maybe you're self-managing, that, that might vary. Um, but if we just base um, how that deal stacks against, um, you know, leasing your or renting your property via an estate agent, um, one, we're able to get an increase in the rent. So um, we're able to get an increase up to 21,600. Um, our fees, um, so on a, uh, a fully managed uh, agreement, we charge um, 8% plus VAT. Um, and then we charge 50% of the first month's rent um, as a, um, a tenant um, arrangement fee. Um, so when we stack that against um, the um, um, against what you would pay with an estate agent um, and you run through the, the stuff that we do for that. So, so effectively, you know, we're providing a, a schedule of condition. Uh, we're, uh, we're doing check in and, and check outs. Um, again, the provider takes on the um, all the sort of call out fees. Um, all the structural maintenance of the void. So that's why all of that's coming in at zero. Um, so whilst we're able to get obviously more money for this property, that's not always the case. To be completely honest with that, sometimes you know we're we're coming in below, you know, slightly below uh, what an estate agent is quoting. Um, 
it's all, all price versus cost. So when you then take into consideration the additional costs, so our fees are very similar to what, say, an estate agent would be um, in relation to the ongoing sort of management costs and then the um, tenant arrangement fee. But then after that, um, you know, with, with an estate agent, you're still covering the costs of the scheduler condition, the check-in and check-outs. Um, you know, if there's um, something that goes wrong with the property, uh, if the toilet won't flush, that's a call-out fee that you're having to pay for, um, as well as all of the maintenance and then and then the voids. So we factored in all of those costs um, on the right-hand side. If you if you just take a look at those, and then what we've come out with is that um, from a profit perspective, um, you know, we're delivering um, a return of eighteen thousand you know, 437 pounds, whereas via an estate agent, um, it's 10,982. I think just just quickly, the other thing to mention there is that our kind of lease arrangement fee is just a one off for the whole kind of three or five years. So so actually, even though this is a comparison on an annual basis, really from a profit and loss perspective, you, you should really be dividing that kind of 1080 by about, you know, by whether it was a three-year lease by three or or five, so it's actually e even uh, uh, higher profit. Okay, amazing. Um, Tim, do you have any questions? I, I, I um, I'm sure we're going to have loads of questions of this, and I'm really conscious of time. Um, but in your presentation, Andy, you mentioned up to twenty five percent, and this is like almost triple that. Is this is this something that is a is a um and the norm, or is this like the, so the the reason we do that is look what I think the, the, us going and saying look we can get you up to seventy percent increase in profit is probably going to do two things: one, make you think it's unbelievable, and two, potentially attract the wrong people. You know, I think the the, the value of supported living is to say, look, at, at the core of it, even if you were to get the same amount of money, um, it can give you secure income and uh, a hands-off experience and a lot more peace of mind. And that's kind of the real thing that we're looking to kind of educate people on and give the understanding on. Um, in some cases, we can make, you know, generate a profit. It's not always the case. This is like a a great example of where where it works. Um, but it, it can't always, uh, you know, providers aren't always going to pay above mark offer. They need to be able to show that uh, approved, you know, audit uh, wise to the council that they've got a valid reason. And for this, it, it kind of matched because they needed that specific property. And there was the whole finance situation of the landlord so that they, that they know, you know, there was a sustainable reason. Um, but, yeah, I think when you take into account all those additional costs that you're, it's just, landlords often just think about the top line and they won't necessarily take into account the actual bottom line of, of the cost. Um, but uh, we want people to understand that the one of the real benefits is just secure hands off income. Mm. Well, I'm glad I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad I asked. I think the copy has started to wear off. So um, it's always nice to understand w why that is. Um, Tim, do you have any questions with regards to this deal at all? Um, but just to make sure my understanding's right, and this, this comes into a little bit, I think uh, Lewis has just popped in a question about the management fees. I'm presuming the management fee is where you guys are dealing with the um, the provider and any issues, any anything that the provider is. You're basically the middleman between the provider and the landlord. Is that correct? And that's where that management fee is going. So then it is fully hands off for the, the landlord. Yeah, yeah that, that that's correct. And there is, you know, again, um, if, if you go onto our website, there is a breakdown of fees. Now, th this is a fully managed, um, this is our foot fully managed offering. So there is a, le uh, a lease light offering as well, um, which is for landlords who want to self-manage. So we still provide support, um, but it's not fully managed. Um, and for our lease light version, we charge 4.2% uh, plus fat. So, you know, if, if we were using that as an example under lease light, um, it would deliver a, a, an even higher rate of profit as well. And as I say, the estate agent cost that we've outlined, I mean, we've we've really lowballed on just, just so it's really plain and easy to understand over a one year 
um, over a one year period. You know, mo most um, most landlords will, um, you know, again, have a, uh, you know, one or two year tenancy with the individuals that are living there and they'll be charging you to renew that um, every one or two years. Um, and with that will come check in, check outs and, and all the additional charges um, every time you renew or find the new tenant, whereas this is a one off cost for the duration of, of that lease. I 100% I, uh, agree. I'm, I'm going through a couple of similar things with the, the properties that I've got, so I can completely vouch for the fact of uh, the sums that you guys are putting for the estate agents are, uh, are fairly accurate. But again, low board on the management fee. I know one of them, um, it's actually my, my mother that has one. She's paying 15% plus VAT um on on one of her management fees which is uh, I, i'm trying to get her to <laughs> to get that down um but yeah completely agree and obviously for what you guys do and and the service you offer in terms of getting the whole market to me this is very much a, a win-win situation for everyone amazing gentlemen shall we go on to the next deal yeah Thank you. And yeah, this is probably very relevant because I saw in the chat somebody raised um, a question about a, um, a HMO. Um, so, um, again, th this is a deal that we did a few months back. Um, it was um, a landlord, um, again, who uh, up in the Cumbria area, they, they've got around five or six um, sort of HMOs that they, that they rent out to, uh, to young professionals. They had um they'd read about us in the nrla and wanted to try a different um strategy just to see how things would work um and i think again th th this comes back to the you know price versus cost um sort of scenario here and that that was where uh, on the market um, they would have been able to achieve um you know 2500 um you know for uh, for market rent um and uh, you know the, the net income on that though, because that included bills, would have been around sort of two thousand, um, and that was for um, young professionals. So the landlord had just created a really nice refurb and just just wanted an alternative. Uh, we were able to uh, secure him uh, two thousand two hundred and fifty per month, um, um, and again that was um, internal repair and lease. Uh, it was for asylum seekers, um, and again that was a three year deal uh, with a rent review every year. Fabulous. And then again, uh, uh, and, and I think again, we, we've been, um, I think, quite generous again on the comparison here on, on the fees, uh, rather than talk you through each individual um, sort of element here. I mean, I'll, I'll just stick to the, the fees are, are, are similar to the uh, to the previous sort of deal. Um, you can see the breakdown there, obviously, with, um, you know, with uh, with HMOs, you've got. Uh, you're going to have to find tenants uh, a lot more regularly. Uh, we put the um, the tenant finder costs um, on, on this deal at around 1500 which is 250 so 50% of the first month's rent for every new tenant. Um, typically, over a three-year period, I imagine that you'll be doing that more than five times, um, and the management might be a bit higher. Um, and then again, the costs are very much um, in line with the uh, with the previous deal. So just if you just take a second just to look through that. Um, and then, um, again, even though effectively you could have – uh, on face value, um, you could have, um, you know, made more money um, through an estate agent. When you take into the account that one, you're having to manage the bills and cover the cost of the bills. Um, you've also got the um, uh, the additional um, aggro of, you know, speaking to tenants about leaving the heating on. You know, I think everyone's been in that situation where, you know, they've had a tenant who's got the heating on all day with the window open. Um, there's no need to worry about that because the provider is taking on um, you know, the cost of the bills and, and responsibility for that. Um, and with this HMO deal, even though the rent is um, is below what an estate agent would offer, we're still managing to deliver a near um, sort of 40% increase in the um, in the profit. That is fantastic. I, I love that. I love that. So another another deal way above the 25, but, but even 25% profit increased, of what of what someone is usually getting is a fantastic increase on profit. Let's just know. That, remember that profit is profit. Um, Tim, do you have any further questions? I've got loads of questions, but actually, I think we're we're tight for time. So I think the 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 ideal here would be to look to get to a second episode and and we we go through some more details um, because I think definitely there's. There's a lot to discuss and I can say firsthand I've got uh, one of my particular places is on a uh, supported living lease and 
absolutely brilliant um it really does make a difference in terms of um my expenses and my how hands-on i am um it's actually just the lease is just about ended last last month so about eight days ago the, the current lease has just finished um but yeah definitely i can vouch for that and everything that andy and paul are saying is pretty spot on um i i do disagree with the management fee that estate agent charges though i think you very much lowballed that on today's market so you're doing yourself a disservice on that one um but yeah, very, very good. And um, I think there's lots of questions from everyone. So I'd love to get you guys back. Yeah, thank you for We'd that. Love thank you for that, Tim. I really appreciate it. Gentlemen, We have I have logged all the questions that we have not managed to ask live. I will send those to you. For all of you that have been here live and are, and are still here and have asked those questions, feel free to reach out to um, Andy and Paul. Um, via market offer I'm actually going to share my screen <laughs> you know what my tech abilities are like so just bear with me I'm going to show you how to actually get in touch with um, Andy and Paul via the website so let's just <laughs> there we go how amazing is that modern technology so when you've registered to sourcinginvestments.co.uk you will be able to head over to the power team tab <laughs> excuse me now when you go to the tab you'll see power team dashboard at the top so that will let you know you're in the right place you just need to scroll down slightly you'll see here um, is market offer on the left hand side now don't take that it's on the left hand side as new members come in that will shift the position but you can see here there's a brief description of what Andy and Paul do and you can then learn more once you click the learn more, you'll actually come to this page here. And this is where you'll be able to get in touch with Andy and Paul directly um, and be able to go through any maybe lease options that you would like to look at for yourself with your own portfolios. Um, and that's where you'll be able to um, acquire the free guide as well as join the impact club that Andy mentioned earlier. So I trust that that helps. We have had so many guests on today, gentlemen. It's been a full packed episode. Um, the, the viewers have absolutely loved it. The chat box has been going absolutely crazy with questions. I will send those over to you um, after the show. Um, for those of you that have sent those questions in, I thank you for those. Um, please feel free to get in touch with Andy and Paul um, directly yourselves. And if if you uh, want to send those questions into me, by all means, it's bonnie at sourcinginvestments.co.uk. So that's B-O-N-N-I-E at sourcinginvestments.co.uk. Or you can send it to the admin team, admin at sourcinginvestments.co.uk so and anybody that's watching this on the replay it will be available on the youtube channel sourcing investments limited in about a week's time if you've seen anything on this show on this episode that has uh, piqued your interest that you want to know more that you really need to get in touch with andy and paul at market offer please email us at admin at sourcinginvestments.co.uk or myself, which is Bonnie at sourcinginvestments.co.uk. With that, we have I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna mention all of our live guests here. So we've had a full packed um session with Abby, Andy, Anil, Boomney. I hope I've pronounced your name properly. Bye, Shay, David, Dawn, Dale, Debbie, Fred, Jerry, Jonathan, June, Liz, Lobke. I hope I've pronounced your name properly. Uh Lewis, Mandy Mark, Mary, Negin. Nicole, Paul, um, that's Paul Hennessy, not you, Paul, that's on the panel. Uh, Pauline, Robert, Salim, Sam, Sierra, Trevor and Veronica. I thank you all for your patience, your questions uh, and just bringing the energy through the chat box as well for this episode. Gentlemen, Andy, Paul, thank you so much for being our new Power Team members, delivering the value that you do to your clients and now working with us and Tim, as always, for hosting this show with me.